Welcome and thank you for listening to today's episode of the Auburn Daily Podcast. Your host Alex, AK at Auburn Memes on all the socials, Instagram, Twitters, you know where to find me. With us today, the Auburn Man of Mystery, the self-proclaimed Auburn's Hallway Monitor, the defender and fighter of all things bad narratives, Pat Barnes joins us once again. And we're talking about a hot narrative that's been going on really all season. I think far longer than anybody expected, even if you'd probably asked him three weeks ago. And Hugh Freeze has said this narrative will very much continue to be a play. You saw it by the title of the show. We are talking the two quarterback system in really a way that we have never seen it before. And even with quotes to the media, something Peyton Thorne had said he'd never dealt with before either. But once again, we're still dealing with Robbie Ashford and Peyton Thorne probably doing a roughly one-third, two-thirds split at quarterback with a rotation to those of us who are not coaches, cannot even begin to fathom or understand the rhyme or reason to why and what they're doing, what they're doing. So I'm just going to go right out of the gate and ask Pat, how would you interpret the reason for why they are doing what they are doing? Well, like you said, I'm not a coach. You're not a coach. So the the grand scheme of things is probably something that neither one of us can answer. I can only pontificate about what I think is going on. Great word. And I think what's going on is they're just desperately trying to figure out what's going to work best. Ideally, you wouldn't have to still be searching for that in game eight or game nine, whichever one we're going into this next week. But uh, here we are because neither one of them has shown themselves to be the answer so far. Yeah, so I think a lot of people thought after, well, okay, there's a few sagas here of the the answer of what folks thought Peyton Thorne would be. So we'll just kind of get to that saga real quick just to remind everybody how we got to where we are. So Robbie, and I've always said he got dealt a rough hand last year with everything to deal with. He was not developed whatsoever at Oregon. So, I mean, he came into Auburn incredibly raw, and I think everybody knew that. And Robbie seemed to be kind of the long-term play for Auburn. Well, given everything that happened last year, fast forwarding a lot, got thrust into a role of getting a lot of snaps and a lot of minutes fairly early on, was probably not getting a proportionate amount of reps with the one team, and then the Missouri game, his first true start. He has an AC sprain in the shoulder, which plagued him for the whole se- whole season with some other injuries as well. And then, of course, somebody had to t- just dive into the fire that was the Brian Harson regime. And, you know, I appreciate Robbie for doing that because he easily could have just said, hey, I'm out of here. And then I guess at that play, at that point, you got to trot in a true freshman of Holden Garen or Sawyer Pate. So he comes in, didn't have the best numbers, of course. That That's no secret, no denial. And there was that cloud was unfortunately followed him through the off season. And the narrative always was they were going to get another quarterback. Well, a few of the folks, I think people thought it would be in winter and you go to spring. Well, in the summertime, you get Peyton Thorne. And so that is where the first bit of hope being, all right, Peyton Thorne is going to be the guy. Going to fall, they're going to compete. Yep, Peyton Thorne is the guy. Week one. All right, we're feeling good. They're still splitting. It was a little erratic. Then we get to the Sanford game. All right, we need to – UMass was way too much shuffling. Cal – same kind of deal. Wasn't really good. Did it get him out of rhythm? Was he pressing? That was a, a word that Hugh Free said numerous times. Sanford game. Everybody thought this is the turnaround for Peyton Thorne. They let him get in rhythm. They let him play for three and a half quarters. There was not as much rotating and shuffling with him. All right. Well, then things got really ugly with AM. Don't even need to talk about that game. Probably his worst performance of the season, just on the eye test, just missing wide open guys. Just completely deer in headlights there in College Station. Mm-hmm. Then at Georgia, he starts. He uh, was he had a very efficient game. Now on the eye test, there wasn't those real clutch moments. You can make plenty of arguments. To receivers did not help him do any favors. But if you look on paper and the raw numbers, the advanced stats, it was fine. Hey, that was Georgia. They're really good. He can turn around, and then we know the rest after that. So Peyton Thorne, in a nutshell, has had his has had plenty of ups and downs, as has. Robbie Ashford. Now, the deal here, Peyton Thorne thus far has thrown for 845 yards for the season at a completion rate of 61.5%. Slinging it. Five touchdowns, five interceptions, 
He has been sacked 17 times. Now, oddly enough, thanks to this week, he is no longer the top rusher for the season. He's now sitting at number nine with really abysmal yards with Peyton with Peyton at 259 with Jarquez at 309. I don't think anybody would have even remotely thought Jarquez would have that low yards at this point in the season, even missing that first game. So here we are with that situation. So before we jump into Robbie's side of it, Peyton Thorne, I know you got some advanced numbers here. What has kind of been your, your take, your saga of the Peyton Thorne era at Auburn? Well, I'm, I'm kind of. I, I guess we'd even start back to when he came in and what your expectations were. So I'm kind of going to turn the tables on you for a second. I know this is on the fly. All right. I would like to first delve into Robbie Ashford's 2022 season. Go for it. And yeah. No, I mean, that's a fair start. I think, I mean, obviously everybody realizes Robbie Ashford was not brought in to start last year. And Auburn and Harson and everybody involved, their hand was kind of forced, I think, to start Ashford. When one Zach Gal- Zach Zach Helzada was not nearly as good as everybody hoping he was going to be, and two the offensive line was so bad that you had to have a mobile quarterback kind of operate back there to give you even a, a shot at having some type of efficient offense. Yeah, because you had I mean, you couldn't survive in that unless you were R- Robbie athletic. You weren't surviving in that pocket, right? And a- Ashford. Um, was is obviously the only mobile quarterback out of that crew we had last year. I kind of I'm, I'm already going to disagree with you a little bit on uh, his passing, uh, kind of going downhill when he hurt his shoulder. I think if you look at those games before that, he was missing a bunch of the easy throws, and that's always kind of been the book on Ashford is he can he can thread a needle forty yards down the field, but the stuff twenty in he he is very inconsistent and erratic on. Talking about those advanced numbers, ESPN has this, this stat. I'm sure everybody knows about this point. It's called QBR. It's not your traditional quarterback rating where you're graded zero to like 250. And you've seen these recent years players get crazy traditional quarterback rating numbers. The, what this rating does is it grades you zero out of 100, and it takes in a bunch of different factors besides just your passing numbers. It takes in your rushing, rushing efficiency takes in the, the difficulty of the schedule you're going up against, your efficiency and the little stuff. It's going to fa- give you a plus point if you made a good throw and the receiver still dropped it, stuff like that. It looks like to me, when I went and looked at this, there has been 17 seasons in a row now that ESPN has been keeping track of these stats. Ashford's 2022 season is the lowest graded QBR Auburn's had since 2004 at a 49.4. And kind of to give you a frame of reference, Everybody kind of looks at uh, Chris Todd's 2009 kind of being that steady average score. He was a 60.3. Um, and that's right smack dab in the middle of what Auburn QBRs have been since 2004. Ashford's was even lower than Cody Burns in 2008. And then surprisingly, Brandon Cox's 07 and 06 seasons were pretty low QBR-wise. Uh, but I think that's what I kind of want to hit on first was a lot of people say, you know, Ash was thrown into the fire last year, was learned on the on the fly. He was, but he also turned in the lowest graded Auburn quarterback season, according to QBR, since it's being tracked so far. Now, but I mean, and that that's totally fair. I mean, the numbers do not lie. And I don't think anybody is going up to fully defend what had happened last year because there were just so many negative factors going into it. And I'm still going to say, you know, the AC sprain, that's – Definitely. I mean, now let's talk about that because he did quote that in the the talks with the media he had. Because, he likes talking about that now. But, you know, he's at a point where, and I, I'm going to, this is a very controversial take here, but can you blame him? I don't know if I'm necessarily blaming him yet. I, I think you can argue it for sure. Because when it, Quinn Ewers, didn't he have that and he's out for the season now? That, so they say he's got that that injury, yeah. Right. So Robbie had brought that up of just saying, Hey, I played through that deal. Now, obviously we're not, we're not coaches. We're not uh, a physical therapist. We're not a orthopedic, I guess, anything. So we're not going to go into the talk too deep into the technicalities of that. Cause from what I understand, I think there's different levels that you can have of that. It's a pretty advanced injury. So don't want to get that far into it, but it's a tough injury to play, play through all the same, talked about the throwing he wasn't making so then you can argue and i'm just trying to get benefit of the doubt 
and just taking him at his word. And I think there are other people that said this as well, but he wasn't throwing in practice at all. So, I mean, you can really say that last year's season, even though he's getting the game time, and then even, too, just being under Harson and Kiesau, I can really – kind of development was he really getting? Because I saw somebody had mentioned this as well. Is like this is really the first year that he's actually probably had any true – legitimate quarterback coaching and i'm sure he's frustrated because it's like all right in his eyes at least i feel like i've gotten better and i'm healthy but i'm not getting a chance to show it the the t- number of pass attempts he's had for the entire season is 26 there's games he had last year that had more pass attempts than that proportionate to the snaps he's played massive massive difference there and he's completed 14 so he's at about 54 percent completion which still you know, you're not going to really want to shake a hat. Okay, that's not the best. But I think he just said, hey, give me a chance to see if I can get these numbers up. So then you kind of have the argument there. And this is the this is the hottest topic with the fans right now of should he get the chance to actually just get out there and see what he's made of completely unleashed now that he, you know, get the reps, get it, plays whatever he thinks he should have or whatever fans think he should have, or – hey, you're going to keep playing in these packages. You're going to make very conservative passes to Brandon Frazier. <laughs> Seems to be his favorite target so far, which it's been an effective target. Or let him go. I mean, what do you, what do you think? I, I, I think they're scared to death of letting him go. And I think they're scared to death because he's probably doing the same things in practice he was doing last year, which was being extremely careless with the football. Whether that was throwing interceptions the first part of the year or fumbling it constantly. I think he gave away seven fumbles last year, and I know he dropped and recovered way more than that. And I, I haven't been able to turn up that stat um, since last year, but I'm, the amount of times he just flat out dropped the football last year was astounding to me. I've never seen a quarterback do but that. But in his defense, though, I don't think he has fumbled at all this season. Well, he's not He's not getting near the amount of snaps he got, so the opportunities no. haven't been there to turn the ball over. No, 100%. And, and, yeah, I mean, like I said, numbers don't lie. But in his defense, he hasn't fumbled it in his first interception he had. And, granted, low throw. Low, worst, worst throw of the year. <laughs> it was a bad throw. And I'm not saying it was a I'm not saying it was a wise throw. Also saying that that very easily could have been a pass interference call had the refs maybe looked and said, oh, it was Javar Johnson shoved right there to make him trip. Regardless, didn't happen, doesn't matter, just perspective. It's still, regardless, pass interference or not, it was still an unwise throw. He made it, is what it is. But yeah, that hasn't happened. As, or the fumblings, I don't believe he has fumbled at all, and obviously one interception. Well, again, he, has, the limits- he, he does look better this year, and I, that's where I was kind of dovetailing this into. I don't know. He has, I think, marginally improved this year. But I think... As far as, you know, he hadn't fumbled it, he hadn't thrown interceptions, the simple fact of the matter is is he hadn't gotten the opportunities to do that, either good or bad things. And probably what I think is going on is, is the coaches saw the film last year, see him in practice every day. We don't see him in practice every day. And a lot of that same stuff is probably still going on in practice. Well, let's let's jump over to some of the quotes that were said and then um, hit – oh, actually, you said you'll start with Robbie. I, I meant to – I didn't mean to interrupt you because you were originally going to go with Thorne. So you yeah. hit up Robbie 2022. Did you want to loop back and finish your thorn take? Yeah, so c- kind of dovetailing off Robbie, too. So far this year, Robbie's QBR, he has improved that a little bit to a total of 53.3 on the season, which would be good for just ahead of Cody Burns' 2008 season. So he would now be – that'd be the third worst QBR in Auburn history if it were so what is thorn now, so far? And what is Thorne so far this season? Thorn this season has a 56, so it's not that much better. Okay. Um, but if you and I think that's it, kind of the, I think that's kind of the tail of the tape is from what we've seen, and we'll get to this in a little bit. Neither has really been better than the other. Right. Um, Thorn, 56 would actually be ahead of Brandon Cox's 06 and 07 seasons, though. So I kind of thought that was interesting. Uh, Thorn, obviously, we've talked about this in the last couple shows, has not been nearly as good as we all hoped he would be. Um, definitely. I hoped he would be after throwing for 7,000 plus yards in the Big Ten um, against some good teams and in some tough environments up there. I, like, like we said before, I, it's, the Big Ten's not that far off from the SEC as far as the environments and the talent level goes, as much as a lot of people want to portray that it is. Um, I think Thorne, we've talked about previously, I think he's in his head as a factor. I think 
all this new schemes, this mishmashing of schemes together, I think has gotten to him. I think the quarterback rotation has hurt his confidence. Um, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you he's way better than Robbie Ashford this year because he's not. Why I think they're playing Thorne and why I think we'll see the rest of the year they're going to play him more, significantly more than Ashford, is they know that Thorne has the ability to be the type of quarterback that Auburn needs to be successful. As much as you want to say that about Robbie Ashford, you cannot say that with any. There's no – There's no. Robbie Ashford has no history in college football of being that type of quarterback. Peyton Thorne at least has a full year and a, de- a full year of good college football, and then the year after that was a year of decent college football. So if, if you're the coaches, you almost want to bet on, hey, I know this guy can do it. I don't know if Ashford can do it. Yeah, the devil you know versus the devil you don't. Right. And then and then so let's just get to the theory there of what is there a point, just a breaking point where you say we just nothing. It is what it is. We're just going to we're just going to throw a wada. We're going to throw a wet paper towel at the wall and see if it sticks. Robbie, just go. Can you be any better? Do you think there's a breaking point for that or is it just, hey, we're going to ride this out through the entirety of the year? I think because he keeps saying was... he's going to get more and more snaps each year or each game, so it's almost and part of me is almost wondering: Do you think this is a? Is it almost like a transition in? Is it like a? Are we going to scare Thorn out of it, or is he still not getting it? Will Robbie start baby stepping up for the moment? What do you think? No, I, I think I think Ashford's opportunity was this past weekend. And they mm-hmm. gave him the start, and they gave. I think they split. I mean, how what was, what was the snap count? I didn't see that. Who who ended up with what amount of snaps this past? I Saturday? think Robbie had twenty two, and Peyton's was in the high thirties, if memory serves. Okay. Um, Peyton got a majority more snaps, but I mean, you also too, he got a whole lot in garbage time as well. So that the last three minutes of that game so we were, added his numbers a lot. We were when we were obviously we were going to have to come back throwing the ball. They gave Thorne the rest of the game. I remember that. Um. So I think I think this past Saturday was was them trying to give Ashford the opportunity to run away with it, and he didn't do it. Um, if you look again, go back to that QBR stat. Thorne and Ashford almost had identical games QBR wise. They were both thirty five, which is an awful grade. Um, when you heard the interviews this week, I'm pretty sure Robbie admitted the very first play of the game he did not run the play that was called out there. Well, no, Hugh Freeze Hugh Freeze said it in the post game, and Robbie also said it to where. He he was supposed to, or I guess maybe not supposed to. He should have handed the ball off, and he said, "Up, oh, well, I." Once again, I think we're going to go back to this word pressing. Was trying to make the play, did it, ran for it, didn't make the right call. And well, that, I think that's my probably- thing. That's my thing with Robbie. Being the level of athlete that he is, you, he has to be able to, op- to operate that RPO, especially those those run plays efficiently. I saw several times that he turned the wrong way from where the play was going, and it blew the play up. Like that play to Jarquez where you can watch it. Um, the whole line shifted right. Jarquez was going right, was expecting the handoff. Robbie just took off left, and their freshman linebacker tracked him down with, with relative ease. You could see Jarquez with his hands up, slapping his thighs, like, what are you doing? And that, that happened several times this past Saturday. All right, now, okay, if, get, oh, go ahead. If you can't trust Robbie to make those plays, I don't know how you expect him to operate an entire offense with any efficiency or effectiveness. All right, I want to get a little. I want to get a little conspiracy theory, and this this is 100 percent conspiracy theory. This is no reports. There's no rumors. It's just a we're on the what if machine right now. Do you think there is some sort of pandering to keeping them both playing for some type of big picture agenda? That could be, but not including keep them both checked in to keep one or both to come back next year, hoping they don't transfer keeping other players in the locker room happy. Cause it's some type of divisive subject matter and, or any other possibility it may be. And let me predicate. I'm not, I haven't heard any rumors to suggest any of the things I just said. This is a, what if scenario? I think they were trying to keep Robbie happy at the beginning of the year, giving them snaps. And I think they did. I think they do. They probably still do, and I think they did want to keep them on the roster then. Now I think they're at the point where they're just in survival mode. Maybe that changes once the competition has dropped down a little bit to start this weekend, but I think 
the past couple weekends, the rotation, they've been just trying to get find the guy that's going to move this football for them. Neither one of them has been able to do it effectively. Right, and I would say where I was at with this. So I thought legitimately at the beginning of this thing, around really at the A&M game, or sorry, the Cal game, A&M game, even the Georgia game, I legitimately thought that Peyton Thorne, just he, it was a bust. Peyton Thorne was not that guy. And I wasn't going to be like, oh, Robbie Ashford is that guy. But it was more of a, hey, we got to do something completely different here at quarterback. He's not it. Now, after the Ole Miss game, I've changed my tune to very much go, it doesn't matter. I don't know if there's any fixing it without just burning the whole thing down and completely rebuilding from scratch. Because here, and, and this is my take on it, and I, I do believe this, from an offensive standpoint, I do not think the offensive staff is, and we'll just label as Philip Montgomery because he's over it, and Hugh Freeze has pretty much said that Montgomery has the keys to the whole thing, so it sounds right. like it's most definitely him. Now, where Hugh's at fault of saying, should he have intervened sooner here? I think it could be a debate and topic for another day, but for just right. what it is right now at this moment, the both quarterbacks are set up for absolute failure, and I don't think there's anything that either of them could do at all. And, no, and there's I, obviously a lot of factors with that with the receivers and coachings and line. You know, it's not just them, but I don't know. I, I legitimately don't know if there's anything you can do with the way it is right now that would change this, no matter if you let Peyton take all the snaps or if you let Robbie take all the snaps or you do this 50-50 thing that they've got going on. Uh, generally, I think the only thing that's just going to have to happen is just pray that things look easier with a lower level of competition and less of a talent gap. No, and I agree. I mean, I think I think the whole offensive paradigm this year was a failure. Um, I bet, I, I'm sure Freeze is regretting a little bit, just giving the keys away to the offense completely. His 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 logic is sound to me to start the season that he re, he needed to focus on recruiting because it's this is something that we've talked about constantly. That's by far the most important aspect of having a successful college football program is is recruiting at a high level. So that makes sense to me. Um, I think I hope I hope starting next year he takes the the offense back or he and Ken Austin or whoever it's going to be and uh, they start they everybody gets more on the same page. To that point, I think the rest of the year you're going to see a lot more Thorn because I think at this point they're just going to say, hey, this is the off show recruits. This is the offense we want to run. We want to throw the football at least 50% of the time. We don't want to be this read option, um, constant run, just have to run it run it down your th 13 personnel. Uh, that's why I think you're going to see Thorn a lot more the rest of the year because they're at the point now where, like you said, the competition drops down. But, hey, we want to show these guys the offense we want to run. And it's these receivers, you're going to get the football a lot. And this is what baffles me. Okay. This is what baffles me. If you look at the raw numbers, we we already been over the advanced stats of just the Ole Miss game. They both, uh, Peyton Thorne, I think, was 69% passing. That's where you'd be like, nice. And then yeah. Robbie was 75% passing. So minus the two three or four there, right? Yeah, but I mean, I'm just saying raw percentages here. And then obviously you had the two interceptions that were bad for both of them. But, and then, you know, we'll give Peyton credit. That probably should have been overturned. But regardless, once again, just like Robbie, it was dangerous throwing a double coverage. But I digress. That's still going to sit there and be like, I would get if we were if we were throttling the passing, if it was just like, God, these guys can't connect. They're getting sacks. The, the receivers are dropping balls. But they were making, even though they were just little chip throws, and a lot of that was padded with garbage time throws. But just to not pass it for the entirety of the third quarter when there really was no reason not to is just still what I – and like I said, not a coach, but I just don't get that whatsoever. Where It was like it would be one thing if they just weren't doing anything with the passing. Like either guy, quarterbacks weren't seeing guys that were open or guys that were open or had catchable balls were just missing them. They just didn't do it. I, so I, think, what's, I think a lot of what's going on is they're, they're trying to shorten these games up. And 100%. I, th I think that's especially true the past four weeks, knowing they were going in with such a large talent gap, especially the first three weeks. And frankly, last week, I mean, th the fact that Auburn's at the point where they have significantly less talent on the roster and Ole Miss it never should have gotten to this point. You can thank Gus Malzahn and uh, Brian Harson for that. Um, but, but here we are. And I think the coaches realized, hey, our best chance of winning this game is, is making this game as short as possible. And uh, the way to do that is to run the ball a lot. So I think that's a lot of what the game plan was there. 
And so the interesting part about that with the, I guess, I guess with the, with the, with the old Miss situation is, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I get, I get trying to shorten the game. But then in, in just incredibly obvious passing situations or just do something situations. Like there's like a third, there were a few third and manageable plays. And there might have been like third mm-hmm. and long, but just on some third down. And I remember this is where there were a handful of times the crowd booed during the game is they just ran the ball down the middle. It was essentially just like we're giving up on this drive. And then like I said, coaching, hey, we're playing, you know, the coach speak of that would be, oh, we're playing field position. Chat, you know, Oscar's booming, booming punts. Defense is playing good. But then, you know, to the fan service, he's like, oh, he just gave up on this drive. What do you think on those? Because I, I, mean, I don't know if giving up on the drive. I, I also, I think they're scared to death of the quarterback play right now, man. I don't, I don't think they trust these guys. And I, I don't think the offense is, even if they had somebody who they did trust, I don't think the offense is running efficiently as a, as a system right now. And when you're a coach and you're, and you're scared of your players, you're, you're going to rely on – the people you trust more. And it's obvious they trust the running game more than they do the passing game, which they should. Well, I want to take a brief break real quick. I want to thank today's show sponsor, Opelika Rage Room. If you are watching quarterback play or if you're a frustrated quarterback, that is a great place to go if you need to let out some frustration, get a table full of goods, you get bats, hammers, mallets, whatever you want. You could break a windshield. You could break a TV, a computer, glass bottles, whatever almost limitless options of things to smash for a set amount of time book on their website opalikaradio.com located on second avenue just outside of downtown opalika not but 10 minutes away from auburn great place to go also with the location of birmingham birmingham rage room you check them online on their website as well birmingham room.com same deal go there book check it out if you're in the birmingham area as well really really fun and want to thank them for sponsoring our show now we get back into it so to kind of conclude us up here, moving forward, do you think there is any pro or con? Do you can you see? I'll just ask this. I think cons are kind of well known. Can you see of any advantage? Can you see of any pro? That's the most realistic sunshine pumped outcome possible for keeping the two quarterback system going on for the rest of the season. Uh, no, I don't believe so. I th- I think it's time to pick your guy and ride with them. Um, if they decide that they do want to do the two quarterback system. You know, they're the football coaches. I'm not. Uh, but as, as of right now, it hadn't worked eight games. I don't think it's going to start working magically in the ninth game. All right. So if it was me, I'd, I'd tell them, pick, pick your guy and ride him the rest of the year. All right. I'm going to do an exercise here, okay? Uh, Peyton Thorne. The advantages to sticking with Peyton Thorne. Way, way better oh. threat. Than, well, historically, based on his past at Michigan State, there is a much better threat in the passing game with him. So you have a better chance to run, operate your offense at full capacity with Peyton Thorne, I think. Okay. Robbie Ashford, what's the, what's the benefits of just saying, Hey, we're going all, we're going all Robbie. If they are positive that Peyton Thorne is never going to get his mojo back. Um, I, I do think Robbie's probably the better option just to, and just getting that 12, 13 personnel and just hammer the ball on, in the ground game and hope that the talent mismatch you have against Arkansas and Vandy and Mississippi State is enough to win those games just, just by playing ground and pound. I think that would be the way you go with him. And I'm assuming we know the answer to this, but do you think there is any benefit to just rolling the absolute dice and say it, Holden Gariner? I guess so, man. But like, like I always say, uh, the guy who hadn't gotten a snap of the football yet when you're having bad quarterback play is always the most popular guy on the team. And yep. – uh, there's a reason they're not playing them is, is what I think it comes down to. We Just because we don't know what that is doesn't mean they haven't seen it all the time in practices. Well, last thing I want to talk about here are some of the quotes that they had with the media. And I don't know if I need to get into specifics too, too much here, but it was very obvious that both quarterbacks were incredibly frustrated. Yeah, uh, for sure. Robbie was very frustrated, and you could tell Thorne was very, very frustrated. I think both of them had similar frustrations. I thought I think both – had some of their own unique similar frustrations or sorry, some of their own unique frustrations. And they also had some similar ones as well. Was there any quote that either quarterback said or part of a quote that really stood out to you for, Hmm, that tells me something. 
I don't remember the specifics of the quotes. It sound, I do remember the general tenor of them and kind of what they talked about. It sounded like to me Thorne was just kind of shell-shocked over what he had walked into, did not expect it to be this way, and obviously had ne has never been a part of a two two quarterback system like that. I think he said as much. And I think this is just a situation he was not expecting to walk into. Uh, I think he probably expected he was going to come in here, be the best quarterback, and uh, it was going to be a, a system that was comfortable with him, and it just hadn't been that. So let me let me ask you this because yeah, I mean that's definitely the that would definitely be the cliff notes of what that would be. Uh, your dog's got some opinions on this. Um, <laughs> he must be a Robbie fan. Yeah, I so he didn't like that Peyton. He didn't like that yeah. Peyton chatter. But the deal with Thorne is it almost to me kind of I got it from just maybe I was looking at it from a with my head tilted a little bit, but it's almost just like I don't think what the coaches are doing makes any sense to me. Yeah, that was sure. kind of how I took it. So. I'm looking at that in one of two ways. Is it either I don't know what they're doing or they are crazy because I'm better than what they think I am? Or it could be a little bit of both. I think it's probably both. But I, to me, the, the bigger thing about his response to me was your, fir your first point, that I think I kind of got the impression that he had no clue what he was walking into and has no clue what they're trying to do at this point. Right. Which is kind of scary because, you know, we can argue, oh, we're not players, we're not coaches, but – I, I think if we were sitting down, Peyton Thorne probably knows a fair share amount about a lot about football. Yeah, I mean, he's, and, he's a coach's son. He's a he's a two year starter in the Big Ten. I mean, he's got tons of experience playing big time football. He knows what a successful offense looks like. You can I mean, yeah. you can go back and watch the tape past two years on him to know that. So, moral of the story there is Peyton Thorne could coach football if he wanted to. Probably not a Power Five level right out of the gate outside of being a GA, but. The guy could have a career in coaching if he wanted to right now. He knows the game. He, No one has accused him of being slow between the ears. And it's obvious that that was a very, very subtle jab to like – and there are times where legitimately you, the person, can be smarter than the boss or the player can the coach. And maybe this is a, a, a silent cry for help of like, hey, this isn't there. When I say coach, I, I think we're really looking at Montgomery for this because like I said, yeah. Hugh has made it very – I even think Hugh has had some similar language too, of just like I don't know what this is. And I think so I think, too. I think, now, I, we'll, think uh, I think you can argue whether it was smart for him to go all in on recruiting or not. I think that's probably his biggest, probably the biggest bone you can pick with him this year, along with how he's kind of dogged out the team in the in the press conferences. But I think it's pretty clear from everybody close to the program and the interviews that Montgomery is running this all show as far as calling the offense right now right and i think i think that'll be a storyline we will definitely be talking about a lot over the next few weeks of hey and then, then you know there's chatter there that maybe this deal with uh you know crime taking a little bit of a back seat on the field coaching is helping a little bit more with that recruiting and maybe that'll help you kind of come back a little bit and try to put out the fire so we kind of hit up with thorn and that that probably is a a synopsis for most of what Thorne had to say. And then I think Robbie's was much more, and obviously Robbie echoed let, the sentiment. Rob, Robbie's was basically let me shine from what I remember. Yeah. And, and I, I think Robbie definitely has got a little bit of a chip on the shoulder for a lot of different reasons. And I think you can argue that some of them are fair, but I mean, the deal there is if you are going to have to have a chip, when you get your moment, you got to back it up and say, my improvement is more than marginal. But yep. also, too, Great. I think you can argue, has Robbie had the fair chance to just really get out there and just let it rip? Because the thing is, is, and this is my opinion on it, I think if you have Robbie out there, you got to just – you got to let him start airing the ball out. you got to put him in packages that are just going to spread folks out and just live or die by the consequences of that. Run it a little bit faster, and that is where he had looked his best. And I was watching some highlight tape of him from last year, and that's where he looked his best when it was like that. Because when the team is spread out, he can either – He's going to improvise a lot better when they're not stacking the box against him. But yeah, I think his they biggest – They don't want to turn the ball over there, so I don't think that's going to but, happen. And, that, and that's – but, see, that's going, to be the, that's going to be the thing is, you know, does he get the chance to do that or was his fate already sealed? And you're right. I mean, it could legitimately be of, hey, Robbie, you're, you're just – you're too erratic at practice. And we, yeah. don't, we don't necessarily know that as of right now. Maybe there will be reports that come out and we will see. But, you know, if he gets a chance to do it in the game, he'll – just got to seize it when he gets there. So, but I, I think his his thing uh, that he was very frustrated with was very much these kind of narratives around him that I think were very, very much kind of a fan manufactured 
<laughs> just and maybe some of it was coaching too. This the whole like you can't pass, so you're not going to pass. Well, I, again, you can say everybody can say all they want to. That's not who he is. The numbers don't back that up. The numbers agree with the narrative, the well, advanced and numbers, and everything else. Now maybe well, he isn't that guy, but he has yet to prove otherwise. Yes, and I think where his frustration is, is as I kind of said with the just the raw numbers of, you know, only having 26 attempts for the entirety of the year, and who knows what other uh, how much of the uh, how much of the playbook he really has true access to. That seems to be kind of where he is kind of disgruntled in his words. So we don't know what that'll actually look like. We don't know if he's going to get, I mean, it seems like he was still planning on giving him his fair share of snaps just from some of the hints he'd said, giving answers. So for whatever reason, it seems that Hugh is not against this. Now, the one thing that was a little interesting is correct me if I'm wrong the way I heard this, but Hugh said I was very involved with the 13 personnel package. It sounds like Hugh was eagerly involved with the stuff that had Robbie. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, that's, that's what it sounded like to me that Freeze was calling plays for when Robbie was in the game. So, Right. So that that right there is probably the biggest head scratcher for me. And I don't even know where to begin to theorize if that's good, bad or neutral for Robbie or the team or whoever. Uh, And that really kind of makes me wonder is who which is that something that they are when I say they Montgomery or Freeze are on agreement upon? Or is it more of this guy's getting more playing time because coach this coach is wanting him in more? I guess, you know, that would really mean he would have the final word on that. So the, o- the only thing I'm positive about is Montgomery is not going to be our offensive coordinator next year. Yeah, I think that is a I think that's a very, very safe take at this point. <laughs> yeah. That is absolutely wild, because if Luke Deal comes back next year, that means Luke Deal. Uh, I think we we're talking about this the other day. Is that is that six or seven? If you count the interim offensive coordinators, you would have uh, Kenny Dillingham, Chad Morris. Yeah. Mike Bobo, Eric Austin Keesaw, Davis for a month. Austin Davis, uh, Will Friend slash Ike Hilliard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Philip Montgomery in the next. That'd be nine, Something nine like offensive that. coordinators. I mean, that's yeah. gotta be a, that's gotta be a record of <laughs> somewhere. And that that would be. I mean, I'm surprised no one asked any player. Maybe that's a taboo thing to ask players, but like. Hey, what's the challenge like of having so many offensive coordinators? You've, you've, you've been on so many bad offenses. Are you the problem? <laughs> yeah, you well, so I was looking back. <laughs> yeah, so it seems like there's there's five players who are uh, in that freshman class, and there's a common denominator here. It's um, you, yeah. Luke. Yeah, that would be a that. Yeah, that I would like not Luke be. Let's just joke. Yeah, yeah. Luke Deal's a great dude. Uh, would not be a that would not be a taboo thing. But that would be a very interesting question to ask at some point. Would just be you know, let's say he does come back and there is a new offensive coordinator. Is like. Has it been difficult to just learn new scheme after new scheme? Because it's one of the things you want to look for, and hopefully when Auburn gets some actual stability, that's like, hey, it'll be really nice to see these guys who can come back year over year and just learn and build upon the same playbook that they had last year. Yeah, that'd be cool. And that has not happened since 2017 to 2018. If if Deal does come back next year, I think the team motto's got to be this one's for Luke. I mean, you talk about it. I mean, you talk about a guy, I mean, you just factor in COVID. And then just every other thing just on the field. And obviously Luke's father passed away a few years ago too. So I mean, you talk about mm-hmm. a guy that's just got a crazy story and just been through so much. And I've met Luke Deal. Great, great guy. I mean, that dude. And, and Hugh Still Freeze. Heard. Yeah, Hugh Freeze speaks incredibly highly of him too. Just I think that's something that any co- – and I, I feel pretty good saying this on record here. Him and his demeanor, his attitude is what coaches absolutely look for for leadership all in the locker room. And that's a very, very important thing that obviously you don't see that anywhere on a stat sheet for what locker room guys mean for just keeping keeping morale up, keeping guys just head screwed on straight, be an example for younger guys to build upon, et cetera, et cetera. So and uh, that's something that that's something that's uh, great for the team. And obviously hope that that culture for many guys that come back next year and in the future is something that they can really instill and build upon. And that's the one thing that stinks with Montgomery gone is. It's just one level of consistency that you don't have to build on. So that is all I have got. Do you have any final thoughts for the dual quarterback system for what it might look like for the rest of the year? Anything you think we missed? Not not for what uh, 
not for what it has been this year. I just want to reiterate. I hope, I hope we see the end of it. I hope, I hope they pick one guy and ride with them. So, yeah, I, I think I think it should be Thorne, but if it's Robbie, I hope they they pick him and ride with him too. So, just got to ride with one guy and give him his reps. Right. No, I agree. I agree a hundred percent. And we'll see. I have a feeling that this is not going to be the last that we talk about this subject matter coming up. But it has been a it has been most definitely a continuing topic through the season, like I said, the beginning of the episode, far longer than I thought anybody would have thought. And there's uh, definitely given us no shortage of content to talk about. So we'll see how it looks like, maybe with Mississippi State being where they are, that the two-quarterback system can look. And maybe both these guys, when they get their snaps this weekend at home, will have some time to shine and in their own way build some momentum. And if nothing else, just give fans something to be excited about. Just generate a spark one way or another. This is my maybe, first Auburn game I'm attending since Georgia 2019, so I'm, I'm hoping for a, a victory here. Well, hey, I'm going to say this. Peyton, Robbie, if you guys are out there listening, put on a show for Pat. He's coming to see both of y'all. He, he said it here. Just one of them. So, <laughs> anybody put on a show for Pat. Just win. Just hashtag one of win for Well, one of y'all put on a show for me, please. Yeah, hashtag win for Pat Barnes. And maybe that'll be it. And if that is it, then – I think uh, we'll get you some tickets for the rest of them. I mean, I think that's the only fair way to do it if you are the contributing factor. Because, I mean, well, look what Auburn has been since 2019 and now. And if they turn around this game, there's only one explanation. Me. So I was, I was boycotting Gus and Harson, man. It, I finally got the coach I, I'm on board with, so we're, we're back on campus. Well, uh, if they do end up winning this weekend and winning soundedly, I think the topic of next episode is going to be why didn't Pat start coming to game sooner? And uh, tune in next week for that subject or for that episode. And if it's not, well, we'll see what it'll be. Want to thank everybody for listening and checking out the show. Want to thank Pat as always for joining us, talking some great Auburn football with us, defending the narrative and keeping everybody's head screwed on straight. He will be out there patrolling the streets and the wavelengths of all things Auburn on the internet. You don't know where he'll be, but he will be there. Want to thank him once again and thank you for listening. Have a good rest of the day and check us out on the next episode that'll be dropping tomorrow.